minimal mathematics in it, uh, which may be a relief for a few of you. Uh, the, the I'll mention a few things which might be more mathematically applied, investigated by, not by us, but by others. Um, one thing I'm delighted to participate in such a broad topic from spanning from molecules to human health. And uh, taking that at heart, I will present actually two different stories. I'll warn you, these two stories have nothing to do with each other. So if you miss the transition, uh, uh, I'll try to make a warning when I make it, but, but there will be two different talks. Um, I want to um, thank uh, uh, Boone for uh, pointing out the, 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 the distinction between these talks that we're going to be talking about interactions and we're very much interested in regulatory protein interactions. And uh, the reason I, I should say that the reason that these interaction uh, networks uh, end up put it, putting all the regulatory molecules in the middle is that they interact with everybody. It's not uncommon to find proteins that 100 have 100 interaction partners. And the reason uh, these interactions are so critical for these regulatory proteins is that the regulatory proteins lack identity. They lack specificity individually. They acquire their specificity through their interactions. And it is, it is that very process of acquiring the specificity that we're interested in studying. Uh, the reason we use direct imaging uh, is uh, also because for us, uh, the localization where something happens, uh, the responses to stimuli when it happens in the pro relative to other processes in the cell, those are the main part of the biology, if you will, uh, of regulatory proteins. Uh, it is not sufficient to know who interacts with whom. We need to know what controls the interaction and, 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 and where it happens in the cell. And uh, we have a number of examples in the lab of studying these kinds of problems and finding out through the investigation of the interactions that we were completely ignorant of the whole uh, area of biology in the process. So the two talks I'll be, uh, or the two uh, stories I'll be telling are uh, one, uh, one uh, done by Huai Deng, um, a postdoctoral fellow now at the University of Minnesota, uh, whose uh, expertise in Drosophila uh, provided the opportunity of translating these imaging approaches which we've done in, uh, in, in living cell systems for many years into live animals. And uh, the other one, which is going to be our attempt at uh, making some impact on human health, is in the area of, 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 of developing drugs for rare cancer by Veronica Burns and Yun Hui Cheng. Uh, my, my introduction, since I have two very different topics, uh, I apologize, it's somewhat presumptuous, <coughs> but bear with me. I'm going to start with uh, asking a question which to me has been puzzling. I think most of us in this room who have been at uh, our area of investigation for some time are uh, proud of the advances that we've made over the last five or ten years. We think of things that happened <coughs> ten years ago, they were really hard. And now we can do things that are amazingly much more than we could ten years ago. Now if we compare with what we're doing in many basic sciences to what's happening in drug development. This is a plot of the number of drugs approved. Please apologize, a rather ancient slide, but uh, the, pi the picture hasn't improved. Despite uh, enormous effort, as measured here uh, by a number which is beyond my sort of comprehension in terms of financial impact, uh, the success rate of drug development is woefully low. And the puzzle here is why is this? We are making such enormous advances in science. Why is this not translated into patient benefit? And this is a too big question for me to really answer, let alone to solve today. But I want to give some flavor of the reasons for this and perhaps uh, where things might go. Uh, now, this is sort of the standard drug development uh, uh, program, if you will. And uh, this is uh, not to scale, but nevertheless, the point here is that we're starting with identified lead compounds through some uh, large uh, scale screen. And then through these individual steps, we screen out the ones that do not fit some criterion. And uh, the reason this is not to scale is that this is in fact a much less efficient or much uh, lower yield process than we know about. 
the ones that we actually have numbers for, the ones that involve US federal registration, it's an order of magnitude at every step. And it's at least as bad at the lower levels, which means that we're simply losing almost every hit along the way, and we have no solution for improving this. Well, the solution at the lower levels is in fact already solved. We can easily screen, we're efficient at going through uh, large numbers of compounds through these steps. The problems happen here at the higher levels where our ability to make any sensible prediction, any sensible uh, analysis of what kinds of processes are involved is really limited. So uh, one of my uh, first stories is going to focus on the area of pharmacodynamics, that is to say how animals respond to foreign compounds and of course the targeted effect is the one that we are striving for in terms of health and benefits. There are many non-target effects and what I'm focusing on today is these induced response pathways, which is something that is initially rather surprising that all of us, all of our cells have the ability to recognize foreign things. It's almost like an immune system at a molecular level. At the molecular level, what's amazing about these systems is that they're able to recognize the chemical characteristics of foreign compounds and respond in a purposeful manner, typically by uh, inactivating, exporting, somehow getting rid of the foreign entity in order to protect the cell because, of course, things that come from the outside is generally uh, bad for us, it's hazardous. However, drugs, of course, we have to get into the cell in order to have an effect. So we have to somehow understand and overcome these pathways, which are, again, one of the steps in this drug development uh, enterprise, which are really failing. It's these later steps in this, 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 this pathway, if you will, that are the reason why drug development, they become really expensive here. So we cannot afford being so ignorant about what's causing the failures. Uh, now, from a biological point of view, um, there's a lot, and I don't expect you to read this list. It's basically an admission here that we're looking at a very small part of this picture. There are many biological mechanisms that protect us from the outside, being in our skin, or the, 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 the step separation of self from the environment. Um, what's amazing about these things is that many of these things can discriminate uh, newly synthesized compounds, compounds that come from chemical factories, uh, things that have never been present during evolution. How did, how did, the, or how did evolution uh, develop the capacity to distinguish these kinds of compounds that uh, we're, we're very familiar with many kinds of biological stimulus response pathways. We can recognize much of normal biological stimuli because they have been present over eons, billions of years in some case, and have had all that time to fine tune the response. But how about the next drug, which has never been present during evolution? How can our cells recognize it and respond in any purposeful manner, not to speak of the pesticide or what other compounds that we're exposed to? And this is the problem that we've been really interested in addressing and because it's such an uh, de evolution development, in my mind, are two sides of the same coin. So we've studied this in a developmental context in Drosophila. The, the, the model system, and, and, and uh, again, I emphasize that this is a tiny little part of this big picture, is this system which has been characterized uh, for xenobiotic responses. Xenobiotics being compounds that are artificial which is based on a protein called KEEP1, which acts as a sensor. And it is uh, dedicated to control of this transcriptional factor, NRF2, and under basal conditions to degrade it. And I'm going to admit right away that I'm putting up something of a straw man here uh, with the purpose of knocking it down. Uh, there is much data to support this model, and I don't say, want to say that this is wrong, merely incomplete. Uh, one thing that's amazing about this sensor KEEP1 protein is that it's able to recognize this extreme variety of structural chemical diversity uh, 
which uh, allows us to function as a mechanism for xenobiotic responses. Again, the canonical model is that this uh, modification and or uh, uh, structural change in KEEP1 releases the NRF2 transcription factor, which then now activates this wide variety of response pathways which act at the level of protecting the cells. Now, there are some uh, flies in the ointment, if you will, in that the KEEP1 protein is also seen in the nucleus, and exactly what, it has, uh, what it's doing there uh, at present, or, or formerly, was, was, was thought to be an ex export factor for NRF2 protein. As you'll see, it does much more uh, of, of, of interest. And, and one of the things that is, uh, was intriguing for us, and the reason that we got into this game, is that the coupling between the stimulus and the response was seemingly mediated by a very tenuous link, this NRF2 transcription factor, which would limit the ability of selective activation response to particular classes of compounds and particular response subsets. And this is something that's observed. If we treat a cell or an animal with a particular compound, we don't get the identical response pathway. So therefore, there seemed to us to be something missing. As I mentioned, uh, we're studying this problem in Drosophila. Drosophila has homologous pro proteins to these mammalian proteins that have been studied extensively. In Drosophila, these proteins do what we might think they do. They support, they, 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 they uh, protect the fly from pesticides, etc. These are the uh, pathways that, 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 that the pesticide makers concern themselves with. Uh, the, the reason we use the fly is that it has many nice advantages in studying what to us is rather a mysterious process. And it also allows us to ask, in hindsight somewhat, the question of where did these pathways come from? How was this, this ability to respond to something that is unknowable, or at least uh, initially not evolutionarily present, uh, uh, developed? Um, Again, uh, we like using imaging. So the first question we ask is where these major actors are. Both KEEP1 and CNCC, these are salivary gland cells. This is a nuclear stain with a <laughs> DNA binding dye. Our nuclear, which uh, uh, initially uh, was somewhat uh, surprising, remember, we usually think of the KEEP1 protein as being a cytoplasmic sensor, at least this was the model just to make sure that our antibodies were uh, specifically, we also make transgenic my, uh, flies in this case, and, 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 and the transgenically uh, expressed proteins are clearly nuclear. Uh, one of the tools we like to use to look at interactions, and this will become relevant toward the uh, second, to, to, to later in the talk, is that we like to look at how an interaction between two partners uh, alters the specificity of their biology. And in this case, we use a tool that we developed some decade ago, uh, which allows us to visualize selectively the protein-protein complex, whereas the individual subunits are invisible, by fusing them to fragments of a fluorescent protein. Now, the fragments of the protein, just like half an enzyme, doesn't have any activity. When brought together, provide us a reporter, a fluorescent signal, which we can now visualize and see where the complex is. And here, perhaps no surprise, the complexes are present in the nucleus. Now, um, again, we're using this uh, Drosophila system because Drosophila imaging is, 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 is really powerful. Now, uh, uh, those of you uh, in the audience who use imaging know that the instrumentation, the power of optical uh, visualization has grown by leaps and bounds. And uh, this is really due to these enormous instruments that are very useful for for many purposes. In our lab, uh, we tend to take a rather uh, more pedestrian approach of just adapting our system of visualization to the particular problem at hand. So in this case, we take advantage of something that is characteristic of fruit flies, particularly the salivary glands of fruit flies, the classical observation of what are called polythene chromosomes. What these are are basically strands of the genome, the entire genome, stretched out and copied in thousands or copied and aligned in parallel. And what this does for us is that it positions uh, individual genes in thousands of copies in a physical location. Uh, 
Now this is not to say that we couldn't do a similar experiment in a mammalian cell and seeing a spot correspond to an allele. But what this uh, polythene chromosome system does is that due to classical work on the part of many people, individual genes have been mapped relative to physical reference maps on the chromatin so that we can, by simply looking at one of such spread, get a genome-wide map of where the proteins are bound. And in this case, we were really quite surprised that the pattern of binding here by these proteins, which have this function, known function in protection from foreign compounds, corresponds to a very characteristic developmental program, which is something called the ectosome response pathway. This is the pathway that the fly uses to conduct what's called metamorphosis, the remarkable process of the fly larvae to completely reorganize its own body structure. Now to confirm that in fact these patterns of binding meant something biologically, we look at uh, knockdowns, essentially loss of function mutations in these proteins, and we find that this class of classical response genes is reduced in expression relative to wild type flies, suggesting that indeed they re require both the KEEP1 and CNCC proteins for the, their expression. This is not because we have compromised development, at least uh, at the level of the salivary gland, because the late genes are expressed and therefore the, 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 the fly in general is, 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 is intact. Now, uh, I'll have to do a little, little education here in terms of fly biology. So, so fruit flies develop from an embryo, and in response to these pulses of an endocrine hormone, a steroid hormone called ectosteroid, ectisone, undergo specific transitions in development. And it was studying these, uh, so, so I'm gonna have to sort of cut out a big part of my talk here in the middle, and say that we found that when we were depleting these regulators in the fly, we were finding that development that was arrested. So it seemed like something was going wrong beyond the inability of the salivary glands to produce what are rather uh, pedestrian glue proteins, things that make the, make, make, make the larva stick to the surface where it's going to pupate. So, we suspected that perhaps the production of this ectosteroid was being compromised. So we looked at uh, a depletion experiment of these pro proteins in a particular tissue where uh, the, the ectosteroid is produced. And we found that indeed the depletion of these proteins, in this case the CNCC protein, results in a delay and reduction of synthesis of this fly endocrine hormone this is uh, the time scale of, of, of fly development. These are, the, they, they, they ultimately form these pupae. As you, as you can see, the pupil formation is significantly del delayed in this context. This is uh, uh, because in this prothoracic gland, an endocrine gland in the fly, a pathway that leads from cholesterol to, uh, just like we make steroids for our use in reproductive and other regulatory processes, there's a pathway encoded by a number of different proteins which convert cholesterol to this endocrine hormone. And we find that the genes that are encoding these, uh, these, 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 these uh, P450s are again regulated by these proteins which, which we think of primarily as, as, as protective, as, 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 as providing protection from, it, from the external uh, impacts. So uh, it appears that in this context, these regulatory proteins are functioning to control the fly development. And again, uh, a control, we're showing that the gland itself is intact. So it's not that taking away these genes has caused development to halt, but it, rather in this case, it's this uh, biotransformation that is compromised in the absence of this this regulator. Uh, so to actually look at this in a biological context, we can look at the time at which a larva after hatching forms the pupae. Uh, 
and look at what happens when we deprive the larvae of one of these regulatory proteins <coughs> and show that there is a shift, a delay in time of hatching, we can rescue this fully by feeding the larva the endocrine hormone. So we can add the ectosteroid into the food and the larval hatching is restored to a near wild type timing. So this indicates that it is the form production of this ectosteroid which is as regulated by these regulatory proteins that is essential for, 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 for maintenance of the development and uh, rather uh, to confirm that it wasn't that we had somehow compromised, somehow made non-functional uh, larvae. These are the larvae that have been depleted and as you see they keep growing in fact they become larger than the wild type larvae because again they keep eating and not pupating and it is this ab absence of the ectosteroid which is essential for pupation. So summarizing this part uh, what we find is that these proteins which we know as regulators of uh, uh, of, 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 uh, of xenobiotic responses function in two different tissues or in several tissues both the central uh, endocrine gland that uh, is synthesizing the ectosone uh, this function is in response to a, 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 a neuroendocrine hormone PTTH and uh, via the uh, the, 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 the distribution of ectosone in the circulation targets uh, peripheral tissues where these proteins again function in concert to regulate uh, the, the, the peripheral response to this endocrine hormone. So these data suggest that this regulatory network has existed or at least also exists as a function uh, to, to control uh, developmental progression and we think that it occurs uh, because the development has to respond to the environment. It needs to be able to uh, modulate the timing of the phi development depending on external conditions. Now I mentioned that we like to look at the protein-protein interaction using this imaging, but I haven't told you anything about what these complexes <coughs> do. And in fact we were surprised to find that the distribution of these complexes is distinct from the distributions of the individual proteins. So uh, here is the distribution of the complexes again visualized on one uh, cell. Uh, the nice thing of this tool is that we can look at individual cells and variations among individual cells compared to the binding of the individual proteins and although these are different methods uh, it should be uh, obvious to you that the patterns are, are, are quite different even without the annotation of these bands. So we were curious what these genes were which selectively bind the complex. This is again one of these features of these regulatory protein interactions where it's the protein-protein interaction that alters the targeting. Um, I'm going to skip this in the interest of time simply to say that we can quantify these differences and show that it is not just a qualitative uh, ability to detect but, but, but a shift in specificity which is occurring. Uh, this makes a more qualitative image, uh, again, without trying to look at the individuals. The left half of this uh, graph here shows the patterns of binding of the individual proteins by various uh, different imaging strategies. The right half shows the patterns of binding of the complexes. And again, uh, the patterns are quite different, telling us that the protein-protein interaction retargets the specificity of binding of these proteins. <coughs> now we look at particular genes as a sort of a biological uh, re representatives of this pathway. Uh, some of these uh, are have developmental context, the juvenile hormone, uh, 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 juvenile hormone um, uh, hydrolases are regulating the stability of other developmental uh, endocrine hormones. The DKEEP1 protein itself is a target for transcription regulation by uh, this complex. And um, again, uh, so, so the question for us was, well, what is the biologic process that is, uh, that is reflected by this complex formation by these proteins? And we looked at the effects of drugs on these uh, flies and found that there are several bands which are ab absent here in control flies but when we feed these flies particular drugs are now present 
telling us that in fact the binding of these proteins is reprogrammed in response to the drugs in a way that is similar that is to the reprogramming of the binding by the protein-protein interaction. So uh, this turns out to be specific to particular drugs. Other compounds uh, which are also regulated in the KEEP1 protein do not regulate binding at these particular loci, they regulate binding at other loci. So this appears to be a case where the binding of the drug, we think in the context of chromatin, now this is one thing we have yet to demonstrate that the drug actually acts on the DNA bound complex, uh, alters the binding specificity of the complex. Um, we look at the functional consequences of this and again this upper uh, group of genes are the ones which are directly bound by the complex and uh, we measure the levels of transcripts of these genes and find that Indeed, phenobarbital, one of the drugs that induces this binding, increases uh, transcription of these genes, and other uh, drugs which do not induce binding of this gene do uh, so uh, to a much lesser extent. This is a control group of transcripts that are regulated by, that do not bind the complex. So these are the genes which we chose as representatives of the binding uh, of the complex selectively. And again, we can also measure the protein products of these to say that they are uh, significant. Uh, to look at the functional uh, necessity of this binding insofar as uh, does it alter, are, are these proteins in fact required for the transcriptional function? We look at the basal expression here in the absence of phenobarbital and we compare uh, the genes where the proteins are binding as a complex and uh, other, protein, other genes where the CNCC proteins appears to bind independently of the KEEP1 protein where we don't detect KEEP1 binding and in the context of phenobarbital both groups of genes are activated the CNCC protein depletion of, thereof causes a decrease in this phenobarbital activation of both groups now in contrast when we do the same experiment with the KEEP1 protein we find that uh, again, KEEP1 is uh, that, that the phenobarbital activates transcription, but the KEEP1 protein is required for activation of this group, the ones that are bound by the complex, but not for uh, activation of this group of genes where uh, CNCC appears to function independently. So there seems to be a selective activation <coughs> of different groups of proteins depending on this particular protein protein partnership. Uh, we can do the gain of function experiment the same way in that by expressing uh, KEEP1 independently we can activate transcription and CNCC uh, with some of these genes functions as a synergistic regulator uh, such as here so the combination has greater activity than the individual proteins whereas uh, KEEP1 acts as an antagonistic inhibitor uh, reducing transcription of these genes where CNCC functions independently of KEEP1. So again, the protein-protein interaction uh, at this specific locus seems to have a distinct effect depending on uh, the binding. So uh, to put this half of my talk in context, this is the classical model which can very easily explain how a compound, a drug, or some other external molecule functioning through a pathway activates a set of genes which in some ways help detoxify this compo compound. Now uh, the challenge becomes, as I mentioned, more difficult to explain when we start talking about many different compounds which have partially overlapping but distinct responses. So how does this system mediate this kind of response uh, and further as I mentioned we find this group of developmental signals which uh, regulate a very slightly overlapping set which also depends on these same mediators so how can this sort of bottleneck if you will be tolerated uh, we say that it probably is not and in this case that it is the complex acting on chromatin which mediates through some, we imagine, allosteric effect, in other words, through binding different co-regulators, uh, 
the specificity of this complex is altered such that it regulates different sets of targets depending on the small molecule mediator. And the mystery remains to us that how the system has adapted to respond to uh, essentially unknown inducers by ways of mo modulating specificity in a way that now allows it to target genes that are specific or, 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 or eff effective for each of these targets. So uh, we like to think that this system occur, op operates on many different levels and I just want to thank the people participating in this part of the work and uh, our collaborators who helped us with some reagents. Now for the second, uh, which uh, will be a shorter half of my talk, I want to return to this problem of I have barely scratched the surface of the problem in, a, in the sense of I told you that I would address this pharmacodynamics problem, but really all we've addressed is, well, we have some hazy idea about where this might have come from evolutionarily, which does very little to address the practical problem of, well, if we're going to develop a drug, how do we approach the problem such that we're not going to get tangled up and tripped uh, along this way? And this becomes especially critical in drug development pro programs that don't have uh, the tens or hundreds of millions of dollars that are typically uh, devoted to developing a drug these days. Uh, and that is the case for, in fact, the majority of diseases which are rather rare and attract very little interest on the part of the pharmaceutical community. And uh, the problem, of course, is that uh, it is not just going back and forth and optimizing each of these steps one at a time, but rather that a failure at the late stage here often leads to abandonment of the entire pro pro program. And uh, you read about the drug companies that shut down an entire division, uh, say cardiac diseases, and you know that there are going to be uh, no follow-up on these, the, the, these projects. So uh, what can be done? Well, uh, this problem sort of, uh, has a similarity to me with the children's game of uh, snakes and ladders. I'm not sure if you, you, you played this. Uh, it's, uh, it's one which is, uh, can be quite frustrating, especially in the context where uh, in this system at least there are very few ladders. Uh, you keep going back and, 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 and go starting over. So how can we, if you will, put back some ladders into this system and allow us to anticipate or perhaps uh, even uh, plan ahead for the challenges of dealing with these steps in, in, in the drug development, which are, which are rather poorly understood. So I'm going to tell a story uh, of a pro project at my laboratory, and I should tell you that I uh, have very little uh, background in drug development, but uh, there are many uh, rare diseases, uh, adrenocortical carcinoma being one, which uh, there is essentially no drug development going on. Uh, which means that uh, this is still treated in the same way that it was treated uh, 50 years ago uh, with compounds that were approved in the 1950s. And there's really no company has, uh, that is doing any, any, any development. And, and uh, the outcome is predictably uh, unfortunate. Um, uh, there are many challenges to this and many such uh, uh, drug development prog prob problems. Uh, diseases are often complex and despite the genomic, genetic advances that are made, uh, the feedback, the turnaround of using that information for drug development is, is, is very slow. Um, one key aspect of this cancer drug development problem is that the tumors in fact retain a very unique metabolism. They have characteristics that are akin to their progenitor cells, which in this case is one that we take advantage of as an Achilles heel. In other words, we try to target the unique metabolic properties of these tumors in order to potentially treat them. And we do this by using compounds that have been identified that have a very selective tissue or cell type specific toxicity. Now, this is a very classical way of doing cancer drug development but I think it has lost uh, perhaps some of its cachet. Uh, in, in our case, we take advantage of the fact that this kind of information is, uh, if not uh, entirely publicly available, there are certainly many drug companies who uh, discard uh, drug leads which have uh, 
very uh, extensive characterization and here is sort of the key to our uh, development plan is that we need to start effectively very close to the finish line. We need to start with compounds where uh, we know that if we sort of get over the, 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 the last few uh, jumps, uh, we will actually have something to release into the clinic. We cannot afford to have uh, the risk of, of, of losing uh, our way uh, along the way. So I'm going to, since time is short, uh, going to sort of give you the uh, answer and then uh, give you some of the steps that we got here and some of the problems that we face. So uh, we've identified mainly through literature investigation a compound uh, discarded in the 1980s which has a selective adrenaline activity and uh, this compound uh, through some uh, pre preclinical studies that we've uh, conducted that I'll describe in brief uh, has been now in uh, three phase uh, patient trials and so far we know that the compound is well tolerated has low potency which is one challenge that we're facing uh, in, 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 the, in these uh, preclinical trials. So um, briefly going over that kind of characterization many uh, cancer drug development pro pro projects undergo so we use a uh, xenograft model which is to say we take cancer cells we put them in a mouse and we give the mouse a compound in this case this ATR101 compound and this uh, decrease in the growth of the xenograft isn't astounding but it is at least a clue that we have something that might have some benefit uh, we weigh the xenograft at the end and very importantly and, and, and here's the critical aspect of trying to decide on which kind of compound would be appropriate uh, the patients uh, that are, are, are treated for the disease, this disease are quite sick given that it is a late, uh, late uh, the diagnosis is of, often at a late stage and therefore we have to choose a compound which has no adverse effects. This is not true of course for the major, majority of chemotherapies which are essentially toxins which you use at a subtoxic, uh, subacute uh, toxicity level. But this compound was chosen selectively because it is so well tolerated here simply represented by the body weight of the mouse uh, that is not uh, decreasing. Uh, the compound can also be uh, relatively effective. In this case we're looking at the same kind of xenograft assay but we're starting administration early. Now this is not really a uh, realistic cancer model. The cancer is usually treated at the time when the tumor is quite large. But in this situation, we can in fact suppress the tumor development almost entirely. Uh, this might be perhaps rep representative of a situation of a, uh, of a uh, adjuvant therapy after, after surgery or such. Um, this compound acts uh, by uh, inducing uh, apoptosis. It uh, induces the cells uh, to kill themselves. And uh, this apoptotic stimulus uh, has been the area of interest. And you might wonder, well, we have these compounds in clinic, what are we doing trying to understand what they do? Well, the critical problem for us is that the compound's potency is not really adequate or at least is going to pose some difficulties for use in the clinical. So uh, given that we have no clue how this compound has this, uh, this, this potentially therapeutic benefit, we have to go back and try to understand how it works in order to improve on it. Very briefly, um, and without giving you much background, uh, we found that this compound causes cholesterol accumulation. So this is a cholesterol stain where this compound, the active compound, causes the accumulation of cholesterol in the membranes, whereas a control compound like this dimethylamine is uh, not causing the cholesterol accumulation. This occurs in uh, many cancer cell or many cancer cell lines of the adrenal. And uh, the adrenal is rather a unique site in that the cholesterol metabolism of the adrenal that makes all of our corticosteroids, the ones that regulate blood pr pressure, et cetera, uh, has, has its own very dedicated cholesterol metabolism, which is why we think that this cholesterol accumulation turns out to have such uh, tissue-specific effects. Uh, it is very rapid, uh, so this compound within a few minutes uh, causes this accumulation of cholesterol which is in fact faster 
then the time at which uh, the cells are starting to die, uh, losing ATP and uh, increasing their caspase signaling, suggesting that this is in fact a potential mechanism of toxicity. What makes it most uh, compelling to us is that using this uh, polysaccharide cholesterol chelating agent, methyl beta cyclodextrin, we can uh, remove the cholesterol, effectively uh, treat the cells with this uh, compound, but not cause the cholesterol accumulation, which saves the cells uh, effectively by adding this cholesterol chelating agent. We can restore ATP to cells, telling us that it is in fact the cholesterol accumulation, which is <coughs> essential for this ATP depletion in the absence of this chelating agent, and conversely, uh, prevent uh, caspase activation, which results in the cell death, and, 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 and indicating that, that, in fact, the way the compound works is by causing a excess cholesterol accumulation. How does it do it? I was uh, pleased to see that in the afternoon we will hear uh, <coughs> one of the presentations of ABC transporters, which are, in fact, the target that we've identified for this particular compound. The compound uh, prevents <laughs> cholesterol efflux, so uh, adrenocortical cells export excess cholesterol, uh, and in the presence of this drug, uh, the ex uh, cholesterol accumulates with a time frame that is similar to the ATP depletion. And uh, this is uh, in, 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 in contrast to this con control compound, which uh, does not influence the cholesterol export. And uh, this group of ABC transport is a complex one. Uh, I won't uh, try your patience by, by or, or, or my lack of knowledge of them uh, by describing them, but there are literally dozens of them. Uh, there are multiple substrates here that are affected. Uh, in addition to the cholesterol efflux, we're also finding that uh, the export of cortisol, one of the products of steroid uh, synthesis, is inhibited uh, in the presence of this compound. And this inhibition seems to also be essential for, 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 the, for, the, for the inhibition of, 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 of uh, viability so that we can mimic uh, the effects of this uh, compound. Uh, so the compound effect here uh, on ATP levels is uh, uh, quite substantial by combining multiple inhibitors of ABC transporter with different specificities we can somewhat mimic, though we don't quite reach the efficiency of this compound, indicating that uh, this particular set of ABC transporter substrates, in other words, these particular inhibitors target different ABC transporters, must be inhibited in order for this compound to have its, uh, its, its, its uh, cholesterol uh, accumulating effect and, and, and therapeutic benefit. Uh, what has this gained us so far? Well, uh, so far uh, we only find that by adding to this compound known inhibitors of particular ABC transporters, we can increase the potency. So we can do what was mentioned earlier, uh, previous talk, uh, effectively combination therapies. Uh, combination therapies have, have, have uh, certainly an appeal uh, the problem is that they are problematic in clinical trials and, and also, um, well, you have to get many companies to work together to, 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 to underwrite such pro uh, progress. The other thing it gives us is that it tells us that there are specific limiting uh, activities. In other words, if we can increase, find a compound which increase targeting specificity for some of these, these ABC <coughs> transporters, we may be able to do a get better job with, with, with patients. Uh, so uh, at present, uh, this is the model. Uh, we basically have identified that cholesterol accumulation is a process that's driven by many inputs and outputs. And in the presence of this uh, drug candidate, uh, we cause a accumulation of cholesterol by blocking several of the pathways of export, uh, causing toxicity. Uh, many people have participated in this project. Uh, uh, Veronica Burns and Yun Hui Chen leading uh, groups of students uh, in the project. Uh, a drug development program uh, requires participation of people of a variety of different interests uh, from expertise in, 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 in drug development, which, which is not me, uh, 
and uh, again, uh, the, 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 the clinical trials are uh, run by a, 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 a startup company that we founded, and uh, we've had assistance from, uh, from many clinicians, which is something which, uh, again, com complements my expertise and has been essential for the project. So I thank you all for your attention, and happy to ask questions, answer questions. Yeah. Can you tell us what was the fundamental difference from what was known before and what you guys did is? Well, uh, what was known before is that there are, uh, for this us, for this particular yeah, for, for, for us what's valuable is that there are very large data sets of compounds that have been tested in animals. In this case, thousands of compounds. These compounds typically come from projects such as heart disease drug development. And often these projects come up with uh, discarded compounds that have been administered uh, to <coughs> guinea pigs, dogs, monkeys, animals which uh, are relatively good models for humans. Uh, I think what mathematics could do for us that isn't happening right now is that although we know the structures of these thousands of compounds that have been tested and we know <coughs> something about the physiological outcome in this context for example we knew that the compounds had bioavailability they were got into the animal they had bioactivity in the form of their cholesterol lowering effect and uh, in fact in this case the operative word uh, we knew something about the toxicity we knew something about how these compounds cause the adrenal to, we knew that they caused a selective effect on the adrenals. Now, relating the one to the other is something that is currently completely empirical. In other words, we, don't, we have no clue about what it is about the difference between these groups of compounds that make some of them adrenal toxic and others not. Uh, I think that is a problem which uh, there should be much more information about, not obviously just for adrenal toxicity, but questions in general in terms of drug distribution. Uh, what causes a compound to accumulate in one tissue versus another? Again, a problem for which there's really minimal information. Uh, it's empirical. Uh, we uh, give a compound to an experimental animal and we find it in a target organ, we say, good, this is a compound that could have benefit a priori. We have no way of predicting those things. So that's perhaps the, the challenge and the difference that we made in this project of making sure that we understand roughly how the compound works. Uh, in continuity with this uh, question, is there nothing known uh, about the physiopathology of adrenocortical carcinoma, a pathway a gene or several genes, heredity, family, etc., etc., etc. Because if I understood correctly, uh, what you did is the very, very old way, just by hazard, uh, yes. taking everything. Yes. And the way now, well, since I think uh, 10 years, the companies, they, if they have a pathway, they have some enzymes or phosphorylation or something like that, and then they choose the uh, active site, they mutate and then they, they try uh, with um, uh, many compounds just specifically to, to um, uh, cible uh, this, this, uh, this site. Okay. Yes. We have some, some information. Yes. So I've sort of glossed over uh, many diseases like adrenocortical carcinoma are certainly not highly studied, but that doesn't mean we don't know anything. In fact, we have quite a bit. We have uh, tumor sequences from hundreds of patients, uh, which, as some of you know, we can identify candidate genes. Those candidate genes tend, tend to be the usual suspects. They are in pathways that influence uh, genome integrity, p53. They're in signaling pathways, beta-catenin, etc. The success at targeting those pathways has been uh, quite spotty. In other words, we've known about pathways like RAS for 30 years. Uh, 
We still don't have a drug. We don't know how to target NIC. Uh, well, those will certainly come, but the other problem with many diseases, such as adrenal cortical carcinoma, is that they are highly heterogeneous. In other words, the molecular causes, the clinical presentation of the disease varies quite broadly. So although we may, in a not too distant future, be able to treat 1%, 5%, maybe 10% of the patients, no, 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 no seemingly reasonable time frame will we be able to treat a large majority of the patients by targeted mechanisms. The other thing is here, I mean, we can get past these, but it is up here where all the failures happen. So by taking the approach that we're taking, we are somewhat saying these stumblings up here are so catastrophic that we have to focus on doing these instead of spending all of our time here. I mean, it is nice to have a specific target, but unless you have a way of dealing with the problems that will come up here, you will never get to the finish line. That is my argument. I mean, we have that experience. For example, I'm in a group that is looking for inhibitors for viral fusion. Yeah. So the target was found, they're the potent, they're specific. The viability becomes already a problem because they start to stick to everything inside the animal. Yes. And then the pharmacodynamics is a mess. But it's very, very hard to do that in the academic environment. It's very expensive, right? Mm. So there's not enough resources that come from a normal grant to do that. It's impossible. There are big challenges. now. There are big challenges. I wouldn't those, call it impossible. No, but, but those are experimental <laughs> problems. I mean, but that's, I mean, I don't think that's an intellectual problem. It may not be. And I think I, I, I want to contrast the two halves of my talk. There's a very different approach that we take when facing a problem of developing a therapy than we take when we try to address a problem having to do with mechanism in even an animal. And I think that that difference in approach, um, I, it doesn't solve the problem, but it puts our emphasis on thinking about these problems early and trying to anticipate, trying to, uh, I, I wouldn't say that our solution, in this case, is generalizable. I mean, I, I think every disease has its own peculiarities. Understanding that disease context, I think contact with clinicians has been key for us. In other words, talking with people who treat the patients to understand these are very sick people in order to develop a drug. We cannot start with a compound that's toxic. We, we, we have to sort of rethink of what a therapy might be. Um, so, so challenges abound, but I, I would say that, yes, except for this part, it doesn't have to be outrageously expensive, uh, but that requires uh, sort of accepting compromises and taking shortcuts along the way. Yeah. I have a couple of questions about the beginning, really more clarification. So. The, I, I didn't quite understand with the, the KEEP1 CNCC, are they direct binders to all these xenobiotics? Is that, or are they feeding in upstream somewhere? And, and if, they're, if they bind directly, do you, are there any structural data on it? Yes, yes. So KEEP1 is a remarkable molecule, and there are crystal structures of KEEP1. Uh, it operates by many mechanisms. One of the major one being that it contains cysteine residues that are hyperreactive. Those cysteine rea residues react with electrophiles, compounds that are more reactive than most bioactive compounds. So that's one big class of keep one reactive, uh, keep one activation mechanisms. This model here of a changing conformation state of keep one has been somewhat corroborated by biophysical data. Uh, the, the, the piece that we've been trying to work on is, well, how do we get from this 
reaction to a target. And that has been the thing that has had sort of a missing link, which we think we've established. I still think that the question of how keep one, especially in the physiological environment in, 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 in a cell, let alone an animal, is able to discriminate between molecules that are hazards than molecules that are mainly active intermediates of some intermediary mass metabolism. It doesn't do a great job in some respects. Fumarate, for example, is a great activator of KEEP1, but it just operates at a sub... <laughs> so, so it's tuned to react with compounds in a very specific way. It also binds polycyclic hydrocarbons, and it does that with a very sort of relaxed specificity that again discriminates between steroids and things that otherwise might seem like it would activate high, high levels of glucocorticoids will activate KEEP1, but not the levels that are present in most cells. Yeah. So the second uh, question for clarification was, so the, the two proteins that uh, are, are going to these puffs, these sites in the polyethylene chromosomes, I didn't, maybe I didn't understand this correctly. When you did the localization initially of each one, they both localized to the disome ones. And yet when you had them, and presumably they're forming a complex there. Ah, that's right. presumably. Uh, separately or what? Because mm -hmm. you said you only, they redistribute when you. Indeed. Uh, what is different about the individual binding of the proteins and when we see them together? A big difference is we only see the redistribution when we overexpress the proteins or when we treat the animal with drugs. So there's something which admittedly is a bit nebulous here between the proteins individually at their endogenous levels and the proteins overexpressed as a complex. Now that something isn't the trick that we play this complementation assay. It's not the fact that we've trapped the proteins on the chromatin because we can also overexpress them in ways which don't allow them to form this stable bimolecular complex. So for us, the overexpression is sort of a, um, it's a, it's, it's, it's a unfortunate, but perhaps informative uh, tool. Um, we think it reflects because it produces a similar redistribution, or at least some aspects of redist redistribution can be reproduced by drugs. We think it has some relevance, relationship to that drug-induced targeting. But uh, in general, I think that uh, the effects of overexpression should be considered problems. More questions from the side, but no? Yeah. So to continue Mark's question, to really know if the complex has a function and, and not just an overexpression artifact, you probably need to do an interaction mutant. I'm uh, not saying that it's easy. No, 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 it, it is easy. So, oh, okay. in fact, all of our experiments, uh, we uh, do this a lot. And we often find that overexpressed proteins have characteristics that are non-biological, that we can't hand wave, such as here, and say maybe this overexpression actually does something that is relevant. Most of the time when we find overexpressed protein doing something weird, it's bad. And indeed, our prime strategy, including this project, is to show that a mutation in the pro protein prevents the signal. We don't get fluorescence, and hence that the fluorescence at, at a certain level represents a biologically relevant complex formation. So what you need to see that now they do not, the, the genes which are they attached to are not expressed. So in our case, the mutation isn't quite as subtle as that. In our case, the mutation in this case is one that simply disrupts the complex. Uh, so it's, uh, 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 yes, yes, w what you're asking is for us to show that uh, retargeting is something that depends on the specific interaction, whereas all, all that we've shown is that disrupting the complex prevents us from seeing a signal. And, and that we don't know, partly because we don't really know what the signal is, what the conformational, wh whatever the mechanism is that converts this protein from mm -hmm. one that is targeting one set of genes to a different set of genes. Mm 
Thank you.